Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager at Barometer Capital, and welcome to another Wednesday afternoon webcast. Happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone out there. Uh, joining us today, David Burroughs, Chief Investment Strategist and President at Barometer Capital. Uh, on this webcast, we will provide you with a brilliant global macro overview and of course address your questions at the end of the call you can hit me up on the chat uh, or email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca and with that I turn the conversation over to David Burroughs good afternoon David good afternoon Pam it's nice to see your smiling face thank you Dave same to you happy St. Patrick's Day thank you and, and happy Fed Day, everyone. Uh, the Fed was uh, front and center today and had lots of comments to make uh, as to when we might see rising rates or not. Um, and so we'll talk about that a little bit later. It is, of course, one of the key constructs that we look at uh, in uh, trying to understand what's driving markets uh, and where things may be going. We're always using the tools that we have to try and drill down through all of the market data that we look at to try to figure out where the market leadership is, where the productive assets are, the things that maybe we want to avoid, uh, and, and to try and keep the portfolios on the, on the right path. So uh, we continue in this structural bull market in stocks. To put it in a more granular way, this is the S&P going back to the 1920s, and we had a structural bear market from 1929 through the early 1950s. And then you had a 19 year structural bull market. So a series of higher highs and higher lows, but sort of two to three steps forward for each step back. And then the market went sideways from 19, roughly 1966 actually through 1981. And then you had another 18 year bull market that culminated in 1999, 2000. And then the market again, marked sideways through to 2013, where we finally exceeded the previous highs and start a new bull market. So while it feels like this has been going on a while, it's eight years, and certainly there have been interruptions along the way. Uh, this is coming out of the bear market in 2013. This is 2015, 16. We pulled down in the channel. We did the same thing in 2018, and certainly we did it again in 2020 at the beginning of the year uh, during the pandemic. But as it is, we are up at the top end of this channel and the market is marching on. NASDAQ is a very similar picture, although the bull market in the NASDAQ didn't break out till 2016. Now we always talk about focusing in areas of market leadership. So the first thing that I would say is equities as a whole are in a structural bull market. US equities as a whole were the first major market to break out of their long bear market. Canadian stock market was much later, uh, and many other international markets were, were much later on. NASDAQ has really only been in a structural bull market for five years, and, and it feels as though it's made tons of progress, and it certainly has, uh, but why we would still say we are relatively early on. We also believe that we've been going through a generational bottoming in yields and a generational bottoming in commodity prices. So uh, some major shifts that have been taking place over the last couple of years and setting up what may be coming at us over the next number of years that might be quite different than the things that have done well over the last few years. So we wanna make sure we understand these big shifts. They really have a major influence on our returns over time to get the big themes right. So going to the granular, there's the S&P 500. Uh, and of course, we recovered off the lows in March, April, May uh, into the summer. And largely it was driven by companies that benefited from going through COVID. The market went through some, some indigestion through September and October, which of course is not unusual. And then as we entered November, the market really got on rails. But the things that worked from September or November on were quite different. These were more companies and sectors and themes that benefit when the economy reopens at the beginning of a new business cycle. Now forget structural bull markets or secular bull markets, the really long cycles. The cyclical cycles in the economy tend to be three to four years. So this is the market 
starting to build in expectation that we begin a new economic cycle as we come out of COVID. And of course, as we move along, the vaccinations are taking place around the world. We have stimulus hitting the economy, both fiscal stimulus coming from governments and monetary stimulus coming from central banks. And it looks increasingly probable that we are going to go back to a more normal world at some point over the next year. The uh, encouraging is that the equally weighted S&P 500, we know that in an index, the largest companies tend to have a much greater weight than the smaller companies. And so we know over the last number of years, the top five or six companies have dominated the S&P 500, companies like Amazon and Apple and Netflix and Google. But interestingly, we are seeing the equally weighted S&P where each stock, each one of the 500 gets an equal vote is now outperforming the market cap weighted uh, ETF. And why that's so important is it means the average stock is participating in this rally. It's not just the largest companies. So that's a really healthy thing. And so this rotation to more economically sensitive companies continues. Large cap technology actually has lagged over the last few weeks. First of all, the NASDAQ sold off. It was about an 11% sell off, quite similar to what happened in October, November. And ultimately it gets sort of oversold in the short run. People had been selling NASDAQ stocks to buy more cyclical companies, companies more economically sensitive. And the market has made a turn here. So we'll see whether the NASDAQ can play catch up. But the reality is when growth is very scarce, people will pay a high price for companies with built-in growth, like an Amazon or an Apple. When growth comes back to the economy and lots of companies participate in the recovery, the money has to, doesn't have to be as polarized in just a few stocks, and that's a healthy thing. Now, still along the same vein, the bond market continues to sell off. So this is the price of long-dated U.S. Treasury bonds, and they peaked in the middle of the pandemic at just about $180, currently $134. So you can see there's been some pretty significant damage to prices at the long end of the bond market. And what does that mean? It means that investors expect growth to pick up, which means that in the future, and it may not be this year or next year, but interest rates are gonna rise. And so if you're buying a 10 year bond, you wanna get compensated for that risk. So you can see that we have had pretty steadily ticking higher long-term interest rates, which is set by the market uh, since August of last year, from 0.5 or 50 basis points to today 1.68%. So that is the bond market voting with their wallets to say, we expect growth to pick up. So that means that we may be in this reflationary environment, which we talked about, where different types of sectors perform well and different types of sectors lead the market. So certainly the bond market continues to tell us that story, check. The US dollar, which has been weakening since April, a safe haven asset continues to be weak has had a couple of weak rally attempts since then, recently rallied up into the moving averages. That was about a week ago. And here we are sort of failing at the moving averages and heading back lower. That is investor willingness to take a safe haven asset and trade it for a risk asset, either equities or commodities or real estate. That's a willingness to take risk. That's reflationary check. So what is it this benefit? Well, certainly the financials have been benefiting. We've been talking about these for a few weeks. They've had a wonderful run since uh, the beginning of October and that's great. But as we have highlighted, we've just come out of a bear market for financial services companies that started in 2008 and we're just exiting. So this is very, very early days. The sector is really under owned in the US. In Canada, of course, banks are well held because we didn't have the same kind of destruction in 2007, eight, nine. But globally, banks were badly hurt, and regional banks, large banks, uh, asset managers, um, and capital markets banks, all of them. 
and all now participating in this rally. Banks do well when rates go higher and when the world is reflating. Industrials, again, this week making new relative highs versus the rest of the S&P, a highly cyclical group, highly economically sensitive. The beat goes on, continues to be very strong. Companies like Caterpillar and Dow Chemical leading the way. Consumer discretionary. Uh, this, the companies where consumers make a choice to spend their money, uh, where they decide that they want to use their discretionary dollars, certainly continues to do well, certainly fueled by expectation of further stimulus, but making relative new highs pretty steadily over the last few months. Again, today, relative new highs versus the rest of the market. Home builders are a great example of that, seeing very good demand for first time home buyers. Basic materials, and that includes all the various commodity groups, again, making relative and absolute new highs versus the rest of the market, led by agriculture, but certainly energy has been on a tear since October, and uh, metals and mining, base metals, and actually some of the, some of the precious metals miners starting to act a little bit better. Another vote for investors moving towards more cyclical investments. Small sized companies tend to do much better in a strong economic cycle than they do when they get hurt badly in a weak economic cycle. Small caps after underperforming for several years, making absolute relative new highs. Check. So we're watching for any kind of divergence that would tell us that this is starting to change. But at this point, I think all of these things continue to highlight the fact that they're actually getting better. When we talk about what works in rising interest rates for income investors, it's not about where you can find the highest dividend. It's about where you can find the companies with the best ability to grow their dividends. And the RDVY ETF is made up of companies that have had, had a history of growing their div dividend regularly. And the relative performance versus the entire stock market has been very, very strong over the last three months. Actually, outperforming almost all, all other groups. And so that's why the income portfolio is continuing to march higher. I think as of, as of tonight, it's up about 10% so far on the year, which is not so bad for, a, for an income product. Global equities, another risk asset, also continuing to march higher. This is the, the DXJ, which is an ETF, which owns uh, Japanese equities. So developed markets around the world after lagging the US also have joined the rally. We talked about that, the Japanese market only recently breaking out of a bear market that goes back to 1991. So here's what we see. We see not only one equity market, the US, but almost all equity markets globally participating in this rally. The Canadian market now, right now, outperforming the US stock market. We have strength in Japan, Taiwan, Korea, uh, China's had a recent pullback, but looks to be firming again. Uh, European markets, the German DAX made a new all-time high today. Latin American markets are firming. So investors around the world are voting with their wallets and putting money to equities after years of money being pulled from global equities. So we've had two, three months now of solid inflows into global equities. That's not something that should be transitory. That's something that should go on for a long time. We're in the very early stages of an equity bull market. Bitcoin, which we've talked about as an alternate alternate to holding uh, a paper currency. It's a savings vehicle uh, and arguably is one that is not well understood, uh, continues to garner new investors and continues to move sort of in a textbook higher highs and higher lows, higher highs and higher lows, higher highs and higher lows. Today trading <clears throat> around $57,000. Uh, and when we started buying Bitcoin, it was down around $20,000. Again, a small part of a portfolio, but it's diversification. At the end of the day, we have a pretty simple mandate, not easy to execute, but the mandate from the clients is identify the structural themes in the market that have a tailwind and then find the best companies or investments that we can find to express that view, to run our process every day, to try and identify new themes as they emerge. And certainly for us over the last six months, commodities 
are in the portfolio for the first time in a long time. And then there are those times when the, the work points to the fact that risks are rising, where we can see that markets are deteriorating and where some of our themes aren't working. And in that case, we have a very clear job and that's to get to the sidelines and to get defensive. Going through the pandemic last uh, February, March, we were fortunate to give up about half what the market gave up going through that period because we got defense quickly. That is not the case right now. Right now we're pretty fully invested. So it is a tactical approach. And we use the process that we have always followed to try to do three things, to try to identify the asset classes to focus our attention in. Right now that includes commodities and basic materials and equities, and actually to try and avoid fixed income. Second, we try to identify the sectors that are benefiting from what the structural backdrop is. And so, as we've talked about right now, that includes industrials, financials, uh, uh, consumer discretionary companies, and basic materials companies. It includes more small and medium-sized companies, and includes more global investments than we've had in some time. And then we use our, our bottom-up work where we use a combination of about 20 factors looking for uh, uh, indicators in the balance sheet and in the income statement of companies that point us to companies going through some kind of positive change within those groups to try and target and take advantage of those themes. And then of course we run stop losses on each of those positions so that if for some reason they stop working or don't work in the first place, they get stopped out of the portfolio. We hold the productive assets and get rid of the ones that would hurt us with little mistakes, not wanting to take any big mistakes. So as we sit today, models continue to improve. Breadth across our major investment groups continues to improve. The groups that we have been avoiding, which are the bond proxies, the sectors that act more like the bond market, uh, and, and certainly over the last while, large sized growth companies, the darling technology companies are seeing some deterioration. So we have been reducing our weights there. Our indicators are very, very supportive currently. Breadth around the world is improving on our long-term models and our short-term models continue to show improvement. So it would be very unlikely to have a significant correction before some of these indicators start to show deterioration. And at this point, it's just simply not the case. They are strengthening on a weekly basis. Other things that we look at for signs of risk, we look for signs that there's some kind of risk, increased credit risk for corporate bond investors and the excess return that bond investors are demanding to buy corporate risk has been falling, meaning they are asking for less extra return to take risk either in investment grade bonds or in uh, high yield bonds. That's a positive. Volatility. Volatility continues to fall. And we know that volatility was very high last winter. There have been a number of little bouts of volatility since then. Just recently, as of this week, we broke below 20 on the VIX. And what does that mean? It means that investors who are looking at the current volatility of the market to make decisions, say on options, are looking for less premium to take risk. To put it in context, over 2016, 17, 18, and 19, for the most part, volatility was at a much lower level. And actually when volatility is below 20, it's the most productive time to be invested in the stock market. And just this week, we finally dropped below 20. So again, that is another supporting factor for owning risk assets. The measures of volatility are coming down. So we have falling volatility. We have, um, we have improving earnings picture. This is a summary of the streets estimates for the future 12 months of earnings for the S&P 500. And that has been moving steadily higher since May and now well exceeds what was expected in February of last year before the pandemic. So 
expectations for the next 12 months earnings continue to march higher as companies became more productive going through the pandemic than they were to begin with. So we care about things like volatility, we care about breadth, we care about earnings. These things are all important. From an earnings perspective, we're finished now for the, uh, for the quarter in the earnings reports. Our average holding grew their beat the earnings estimate by almost 30%. The average company in the market beat earnings by 19%. So our company has well exceeded the average company in the market, both on earnings and sales surprise. Liquidity, liquidity continues to improve. So it looks as though the $1.9 trillion stimulus package has passed. That's fiscal stimulus for the large, in large part, checks being written to US citizens. One of the reasons why the consumer discretionary group has been so strong. We also know that it's highly likely there's going to be an additional package that will be for infrastructure. That also will have an impact. The average household has much more liquidity than it has had in several years. And we know a lot of that money plans to work its way into the stock market. And that's just the US. So earnings picture improving, liquidity by way of monetary and fiscal stimulus continuing to improve, uh, volatility continuing to get lower, go lower, and credit risk continuing to look lower. These are all supportive things. And that brings us to the Fed. So today, uh, Chairman Powell went to great lengths to make his point. And that is that while he expects a significant pickup in GDP through the remainder of this year, and for very strong GDP growth next year, and while he is looking for inflation to get to their target of 2% and exceed it for an extended period of time, they have no plans at the present to try and take the punch bowl away. Now, this is important because this is how many cycles finish. The, the economy ramps up and the Fed takes the punch bowl away. The Fed's been very clear about saying that they have no intention of taking the punch bowl away until we get back to full employment. And that could take several years. Only a few participants on the Fed Open Market Committee expect rates to rise even by 2023. So the old term, don't fight the Fed, the market took that as positive, an overt message to investors to say, don't expect rising short-term rates anytime soon. So we have liquidity, we have lower volatility, we have improving breadth, we have improving earnings prospects, we have um, good, good, um, low uh, credit spreads. These things are all supportive. So as it sits, we are fully invested. When we look at the progression of our holdings, they have continued to change as the market has evolved. A month ago, 16% of our assets were sitting in financial services investments. Today, it's over 30%. This is the group that most benefits from a steepening yield curve or rising long-term interest rates, which we are certainly seeing, and improving business conditions. This is close to three times the S&P 500 waiting for financials. So it's a significant overweight. Energy has gone from 1.5% to 13.5%. And the weighting in the S&P is 3%. So again, a significant overweight. Materials, which is 2.7% of the S&P, is close to 11% of our portfolio. So this is why our portfolios act very little like the market. Consumer discretionary is sort of in line. Industrials is sort of in line. Technology now is a significant underweight because in our view, it's a group that is well-owned and certainly well-loved and certainly highly priced, but is underperforming the rest of the market currently. Uh, we have low weightings in healthcare. We have low weightings in utilities. We have no weighting in consumer staples. These are the groups that would do well if bond yields fell and if growth was slow. So uh, this is a, a substantial deviation away from the S&P index. And of course, we don't measure ourselves purely by the S&P. We measure ourselves against, uh, against uh, equity income universe. We measure ourselves against the global equity universe. Uh, but the portfolios are fairly heavily skewed. If, of course, things change, we will change the portfolios and become more defensive. But at this point, we think 
uh, we have some uh, pretty uh, smooth water longer term in front of us. Uh, we can have some turbulence at any point in time, uh, but it looks as though the major factors that would drive markets continue to improve. So uh, we continue to be quite confident. If you've got questions, certainly happy to answer them. I wanted to highlight the fact that we're always looking for new themes. Uh, two years ago, we raised a small fund to invest in music copyrights. So that's intellectual property, where we get a royalty every time the music is played. Uh, we buy catalogs of music. Uh, we're raising a, a second fund. The first fund did exceedingly well. Uh, and uh, we expect the second one to do quite well. Also, it's something that has very little correlation to the stock market, has something that's very little correlated to the economy. So it's a diversifier. And if anybody's interested in joining our webcast, we're doing one tomorrow at 4 p.m. with Michael McCarty and Gavin Brown, who are our partners uh, in the music fund. The, the, the venture has been written up in a number of publications recently. And it's just something that is quite interesting. And it's uh, it's an income producing asset that we think has a very little market risk. It's something that might be interesting to some of our investors. So with that, Pamela, if there are any questions, happy to take them. Uh, not a lot of new information today, but uh, glad to see that the portfolios are kind of in the right spots. Thanks so much, Dave. Uh, you mentioned that commodities are starting to take a meaningful position in our portfolios. When do you think gold equities will go higher and what event do you think would trigger this? Well, look, there are a number of reasons why, uh, why gold might do well. Uh, obviously, one reason why investors buy gold is they are concerned about uh, paper currency being, being, being printed. And we know that, you know, 21, 22% of all the U.S. dollars in, in existence were printed last year. Um, and so that's one reason. Um, if, if you look at um, the gold equities, so this is a chart of the GDX index, which is the gold equities index. Uh, it made a high in 2016 and then consolidated through 17, 18, 19, and 20, and then finally broke out you know, in the spring of 2020 and rallied into October. And then has pulled back since then to its original breakout point. So if you think about the chart that we looked at uh, for Japan or the chart that we looked at for Taiwan or the chart that we looked at for, um, for uh, China, you know, when markets break out, they often pull back and retest that breakout point. So the market has been consolidating and you can see that in the various indicators. But we think we are at the point where we have now retested these levels and we're likely to see a turn. So uh, markets don't go straight higher. They, they get people excited and then they, you know, put people to sleep. Um, but it looks to me as though this is where you should see a technical term. And certainly there's lots of um, global stimulus being pushed into the system. This is the price of silver, similar. And this just, just goes back through the last year. We made a high in August and we've consolidated along the moving averages. And actually this afternoon, silver was up about two and a half percent. Uh, and certainly the equities were very strong. And if you look at, for instance, silver versus the Commodity Research Board's index, so this is a relative indicator. Again, it broke out and pulled back and has retested those levels. So I think we are very close to seeing both of these groups, the silver stocks and the gold stocks, break out. Uh, it remains to be seen. Uh, but it fits with the commodities picture because commodities are breaking out of a long-term bear market. We've already seen agriculture stocks break out. We've seen the base metals companies break out. We talked about Rio Tinto recently. So um, I think it's a matter of time. And I'd be surprised if over the next couple of months, we don't start another run higher in both the gold and silver stocks. Thanks so much, Dave. One last question here. Um, how is Canada expected to do this year relative to U.S. and world markets? Are all the gains already in, or do you think there are more to go? Yeah, no, I think that I think the Canadian market looks quite good. Um, you know, if you were to uh, take a look at the TSX 60, um, it's working its way. Excuse me, that's that's the old index. I apologize. Let's look at let's look at the EWC.
so you can see this is this is the Canadian uh, index, and this is relative to the S and P 500. This rising line means that it is currently outperforming the S and P and actually at a new 52-week high relative to the S and P. So why is that? Well, the Canadian market tends to act more like a global market and actually more like an emerging market than the U.S. market. The U.S. market is more heavily made up of companies in consumer discretionary and healthcare and technology, and Canada has much bigger weighting in things like energy and basic materials. So the Canadian, if we believe that basic materials are new leadership in this market, have begun a new bull market, then those parts of the Canadian market should benefit. And so certainly they have been, the Canadian energy sector has been acting very well. The Canadian mining sector has been acting very well. And you know, the Canadian banks benefit from that. So again, the Canadian banks are, are performing really well. So no, I think that the strength in the Canadian stock market, and I've not been a fan of the Canadian stock market sort of since 2014, um, when a lot of the commodity prices rolled over, uh, but we are quite bullish on Canada, which is why we have in portfolios a much greater weight in Canada than we've had in, in uh, three, four years. Well, that concludes our questions for today, Dave. So thank you very much. I'll leave you with the final words. Yeah, look, um, I, I think that when, when we look for the things that would concern us, certainly sentiment is getting stronger. So people are becoming more bullish. But I think that that's still relatively early days. When we look at flows, flows have been out of global equities for years. We've had three months of flows into global equities. We've had massive flows into bonds for years. We've had a couple of months with relatively small flows out of bonds. So those are both early stage changes. When I look at liquidity, fiscal and monetary, it's very, very good. When I look at consumer, the consumer uh, state of being, the consumer savings, they're very strong. When I look at risk measures like volatility, they are supportive. When we look at breadth, it's improving virtually around the world for equities and for commodities companies. So we watch for it, but I can't point to anything at this point other than potentially some seasonality in the spring where May, June, you know, can be weaker, but I think we're a ways away from that. The one thing that we do keep in mind is that there are a lot of investors who are forced to rebalance their holdings when one asset class does better than the other. And certainly bonds have been very poor over the last number of months and the stocks much better. So I think at the end of the quarter, there's likely to be some institutional rebalancing from equities into bonds, but that is just one component. And that's something that we watch, but not something that we're overly concerned about. So we watch for things to worry about. Uh, and it's, it's my nature to worry all the time. Um, but at this point, there's nothing that we can hang our hat on that would tell us that we should be more cautious. In fact, we think most investors are probably a little too cautious uh, and we'll see money come back to this market that got yanked out during the pandemic and people waited for a big correction that just didn't come. Dave, that's it for today. Great. Thanks, everybody, for logging in. And if you've got any questions, certainly don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, I'm happy to jump on the line at any given time. And uh, if you're interested, please join us for our call on the, uh, the Barometer Music Fund tomorrow, if you're interested. And uh, if not, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.